Hello, I'm Ashton Sharon, and this is Sharon the Story. Today, we will be reading from The Little Prince, chapters 7 through 9. Um, chapter 7. On the fifth day, again, as always, it was thanks to the sheep, the secret of the little prince's life was revealed to me. Abruptly, without anything to lead up to it, and as if the question had been born of a long and silent meditation on his problem, he demanded, a sheep, if it eats little bushes, does it eat flowers too? A sheep, I answered, eats anything it finds in its reach. Even flowers that have thorns? Yes, even flowers that have thorns. Then the thorns, what use are they? I did not know. At that moment, I was very busy trying to unscrew a bolt that had got stuck in my engine. I was very much worried for it was becoming clear to me that the breakdown of my plane was extremely serious. And I had so little drinking water left that I had to fear the worst. The thorns, what use are they? The little prince never let go of the question once he had asked it. As for me, I was upset over that bolt and I answered with the first thing that came into my head. The thorns, of our, the thorns are of no use at all. Flowers have thorns just for spite. Oh, there was a moment of complete silence. Then the little prince flashed back at me with a kind of resentfulness. I don't believe you. Flowers are weak creatures. They are naive. They reassure themselves as best they can. They believe that their thorns are terrible weapons. I did not answer. At that instant, I was saying to myself, if this bolt will, still won't turn, I'm going to knock it out with my hammer. Again, the little prince disturbed my thoughts. And you actually believe that the flowers... Oh, no, I cried. No, no, no. I don't believe anything. I answered you with the first thing that came into my head. Don't you see? I'm very busy with matters of consequence. He stared at me, thunderstruck. Matters of consequence? He looked at me there with my hammer in my hand, my fingers black with engine grease, bending down over an object which seemed to him extremely ugly. You talk just like grown-ups. That made me a little ashamed, but he went on relentlessly. You mix everything up together. You confuse everything. He was really very angry. He tossed his golden curls in the breeze. I know a planet where there is a certain red-faced gentleman. He has never smelled a flower. He has never looked at a star. He has never loved anyone. He has never done anything in his life but add up figures. And all day, he says over and over, just like you, I am busy with matters of consequence. And that makes him swell up with pride. But he is not a man. He is a mushroom. A what? A mushroom. The little prince was now white with rage. The flowers have been growing thorns for millions of years. For millions of years, the sheep have been eating them just the same. And it is not a matter of consequence to try... And is it not a matter of consequence to try to understand why the flowers go to so much trouble to grow thorns, which are never of any use to them? Is the warfare between the sheep and the flowers not important? Is this not of more consequence than a fat, red-faced gentleman's sums? And if I know, and if I know, I, myself, one flower, which is unique in the world, which grows Nowhere but on my planet, but which one little sheep can destroy in a single bite some morning without even noticing that he is doing. Oh, you think that is not important? His face turned from white to red as he continued. If someone loves a flower of which just one single blossom grows in all the millions and millions of stars, it is enough to make him happy just to look at the stars. He can say to himself, somewhere my flower is there. But if the sheep eats the flower, in one moment all his stars will be darkened. And you think that is not important? He could not say anything more. His words were choked by sobbing. The night had fallen. I had let my tools drop from my hands. Of what moment now was my hammer, my bolt, or thirst, or death? On one star, one planet, my planet, the earth, there was a little prince to be comforted. I took him in my arms and rocked him. 
I said to him, the flower that you love is not in danger. I will draw you a muzzle for your sheep. I will draw you a railing to put around your flower. I will. I did not know what to say to him. I felt awkward and blundering. I did not know how I could reach him, where I could overtake him, and go on hand in hand with him once more. It is such a secret place, the land of tears. As a mom, this chapter just gets me right in the feels because there's so many times we don't realize the things that we do when we're just busy and thinking, oh, we've got to solve this problem, we've got to solve this problem. And to our kids, the things that they're going through are really big deals. And actually, most of the time, they know a lot better than we do what really is important. Loving something and wanting to, just that reaction of going, I love you. I want to hold you. I want to make sure that you have this flower taken care of. I'll draw you the muzzle for your sheep. I'll draw that railing <laughs> to put your flower in is exactly how we feel towards our kids, even though most of the time or some of the time we can get really distracted by something like a bolt that's really annoying us. So I think that's a really good message from that chapter. Chapter 8. I soon learned to know this flower better. On the little prince's planet, the flowers had always been very simple. They had only one ring of petals. They took up no room at all. They were a trouble to nobody. One morning, they would appear in the grass, and by night, they would have faded peacefully away. But one day, from a seed blown from no one knew where, a new flower had come up, and the little prince had watched very closely over the small sprout, which was not like any other small sprouts on his planet. It might, you see, have been a new kind of baobab. But the shrub soon stopped growing and began to get ready to produce a flower. The little prince, who was present at the first appearance of a huge bud, felt at once that some sort of miraculous apparition must emerge from it. But the flower was not satisfied to com complete the preparations for her beauty in the shelter of her green chamber. She chose her colors with the greatest care. She dressed herself slowly. She adjusted her petals one by one. She did not wish to go out into the world all rumpled like the field poppies, it was only in the full radiance of her beauty that she wished to appear. Oh yes, she was a, a Oh yes, she was a coatish creature, and her mysterious adornment lasted for days and days. Then one morning, exactly at sunrise, she suddenly showed herself. And after working with all this painstaking precision, she yawned and said, Ah, I am scarcely awake. I beg that you will excuse me. My petals are still all disarranged. But the little prince could not restrain his admiration. Oh, how beautiful you are. Am I not? The flower responded sweetly. And I was born at the same moment as the sun. The little prince could guess easily enough that she was not any too modest, but how moving and exciting she was. I think it is time for breakfast, she added an instant later, if you would have the kindness to think of my needs. And the little prince, completely abashed, went to look for a sprinkling can of fresh water. So he tended the flower. So too, she began very quickly to torment him with her vanity, which was, if the truth be known, a little difficult to deal with. One day, for instance, when she was speaking when she was speaking of her four thorns, she said to the little prince, let the tigers come with their claws. There are no tigers on my planet, the little prince objected. And anyway, tigers do not eat weeds. I am not a weed, the flower replied. Please excuse me. I am not afraid at all of tigers, she went on, but I have a horror of drafts. I suppose you wouldn't have a screen for me. A horror of drafts, that is bad luck for a plant, remarked the little prince, and added to himself, this flower is a very complex creature. At night, I want you to put me under a glass globe. It is very cold where you live, in the place I came from. 
but she interrupted herself at that point. She had come in the form of a seed. She could not have known anything of other worlds, embarrassed over having let herself be caught on. The verge of such a naive untruth, she coughed two or three times in order to put the little prince in the wrong. The screen? I was just going to look for it when you spoke to me. Then she forced her cough a little more so that she could, so that he should suffer from remorse just the same. So the little prince, in spite of all the goodwill that was inseparable from his love, had soon come to doubt her. He had taken seriously words which were without importance, and it made him very unhappy. I ought not to have listened to her, he confided to me one day. One never ought to listen to flowers. One should simply look at them and breathe their fragrance. Mine perfumed all my planet, but I did not know how to take pleasure in all her grace. This tale of claws, which has which disturbed me so much, should only have filled my heart with tenderness and pity. And he continued his confidences. The fact is that I did not know how to understand anything. I ought to have judged by deeds and not by words. She cast her fragrance and her radiance over me. I ought never to have run away from her. I ought to have guessed all the affection that laid behind her poor little stragment stratagems, sorry, that lay behind her poor little stratagems. Flowers are so inconsistent, but I was too young to know how to love her. What a chapter. And what that really talks about is the nature of love in a lot of ways and how sometimes we hide behind words. But I think one of the, the most poignant parts of that chapter is um, the idea where he says, I should have just listened to her her deeds and the things that she did rather than what she said. She gave me her fragrance. She gave me that source of love in a lot of ways. Chapter 9. I believe that for his escape, he took advantage of the migration of a flock of wild birds. On the morning of his departure, he put his planet in perfect order. He carefully cleaned out his active volcanoes. He possessed two active volcanoes, and they were very convenient for heating his breakfast in the morning. He also had one volcano that was extinct. But as he said, one never knows, so he cleaned out the extinct volcano too. If they are well cleaned out, volcanoes burn slowly and steadily without any eruptions. Volcanic eruptions are like fires in a chimney. On our earth, we are obviously much too small to clean out our, vo our volcanoes. That is why they bring no end of trouble upon us. The little prince also pulled up with a certain sense of dejection the last little shoots of the baobabs. He believed that he would never want to return, but on this last morning, all these familiar tasks seemed very precious to him. And when he watered the flower for the last time and prepared to place her under the shelter of her glass globe, he realized that he was very close to tears. Goodbye, he said to the flower, but she made no answer. Goodbye, he said again. Here's a picture of the him cleaning out his volcanoes. The flower coughed, but it was not because she had not because she had a cold. I have been silly, she said to him at last. I ask your forgiveness. Try to be happy. He was surprised by this absence of, re of reproaches. He stood there all bewildered, the glass globe held, arrested in midair. He did not understand this quiet sweetness. Of course I love you, the flower said to him. It is my fault that you have not known it all the while. That is of no importance, but you, you have been just as foolish as I. Try to be happy. Let the glass globe be. I don't want it anymore. But the wind? My cold is not so bad as all that. The cool night air will do me good. I am a flower. But the animals? Well, I must endure the presence of two or three caterpillars if I wish to become acquainted with the butterflies. It seems that they are very beautiful, and if not the butterflies and the caterpillars, who will call upon me? You will be far away. As for the large animals, I am not at all afraid of any of them, 
I have my claws. And naively, she showed her four thorns. Then she added, don't linger like this. You have decided to go away. Now go. For she did not want him to see her crying. She was such a proud flower. And that's the end of chapter nine. And those are the chapters we had planned on reading today. So I hope you enjoyed those couple of chapters. I think those really talk a lot about what it seems like to be in love and to love and how we love. So those are all discussions that you can, of course, always join me in our Discord for. Um, you can find that through Patreon or just um, in the comments here. We'll talk about it a little bit. Um, this is Ashton Sharon, and this is Sharon a Story. And keep a lookout because we're going to do some original stories soon. Um, there may be a link in the description to one of those or a link somewhere over in this area. Um, I love that you want to share in the story with us. I'm so glad that you're here. I'm so glad that you found us. Please reach out, comment, like. Um, if you've liked this video, please like it. Subscribe if you, if you want to. Uh, thank you so much and have a great day. Bye.